Section 20 of The Theory of Moral Sentiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer W. The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith. Part 3. Chapter 6. In what cases the sense of duty ought to be the soul of our conduct, and in what cases it ought to concur with other motives. Religion affords such strong motives to the practice of virtue, and guards us by such powerful restraints from the temptations of vice, that many have been led to suppose that religious principles were the sole laudable motives of action. We ought neither, they said, to reward from gratitude, nor punish from resentment. We ought neither to protect the helplessness of our children, nor afford support to the infirmities of our parents from natural affection. All affections for particular objects ought to be extinguished in our breast, and one great affection take place of all others, the love of the Deity, the desire of rendering ourselves agreeable to Him, and of directing our conduct in every respect according to His will. We ought not to be grateful from gratitude, we ought not to be charitable from humanity. We ought not to be public-spirited from the love of our country, nor generous and just from the love of mankind. The sole principle and motive of our conduct in the performance of all those different duties ought to be a sense that God has commanded us to perform them. I shall not at present take time to examine this opinion particularly. I shall only observe that we should not have expected to have found it entertained by any sect who profess themselves of a religion in which, as it is the first precept to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength, so it is the second to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and we love ourselves surely for our own sakes, and not merely because we are commanded to do so. That the sense of duty should be the sole principle of our conduct is nowhere the precept of Christianity, but that it should be the ruling and the governing one, as philosophy and, as indeed, common sense directs. It may be a question, however, in what cases our actions ought to arise chiefly or entirely from a sense of duty, or from a regard to general rules, and in what cases some other sentiment or affection ought to concur and have a principal influence. The decision of this question, which cannot perhaps be given with any great accuracy, will depend upon two different circumstances. First, upon the natural agreeableness or deformity of the sentiment or affection which would prompt us to any action independent of all regard to general rules, and secondly, upon the precision and exactness, or the looseness and inaccuracy, of the general rules themselves. First, I say, it will depend upon the natural agreeableness or deformity of the affection itself, how far our actions ought to arise from it, or entirely proceed from a regard to the general rule. All those graceful and admired actions to which the benevolent affections would prompt us ought to proceed as much from the passions themselves as from any regard to the general rules of conduct. A benefactor thinks himself but ill-requited if the person upon whom he has bestowed his good offices repays them merely from a cold sense of duty and without any affection to his person. A husband is dissatisfied with the most obedient wife when he imagines her conduct is animated by no other principle besides her regard to what the relation she stands in requires. Though a son should fail in none of the offices of filial duty, yet if he wants that affectionate reverence which so well becomes him to feel, the parent may justly complain of his indifference. Nor could a son be quite satisfied with a parent who, though he performed all the duties of his situation, had nothing of that fatherly fondness which might have been expected of him. With regard to all such benevolent and social affections, it is agreeable to see the sense of duty employed rather to restrain than to enliven them, rather to hinder us from doing too much than to prompt us to do what we ought. It gives us pleasure to see a father obliged to check his own fondness, a friend obliged to set bounds to his natural generosity, a person who has received a benefit obliged to restrain the too sanguine gratitude of his own temper. The contrary maxim takes place with regard to the malevolent and unsocial passions. 
we ought to reward from the gratitude and generosity of our hearts without any reluctance and without being obliged to reflect how great the propriety of rewarding but we ought always to punish with reluctance and more from a sense of the propriety of punishing than from any savage disposition to revenge nothing is more graceful than the behavior of the man who appears to resent the greatest injuries more from a sense that they deserve and are the proper objects of resentment than from feeling himself the furies of that disagreeable passion who like a judge considers only the general rule which determines what vengeance is due for each particular offence who in executing that role feels less for what himself has suffered than for what the offender is about to suffer who though in wrath remembers mercy and is disposed to interpret the rule in the most general and favorable manner and to allow all the alleviations which the most candid humanity could consistently with good sense admit of as the selfish passions according to what has formerly been observed hold in other respects a sort of middle place between the social and unsocial affections so do they likewise in this the pursuit of the objects of private interest in all common little and ordinary causes ought to flow rather from a regard to the general rules which prescribe such conduct than from any passion for the objects themselves but upon more important and extraordinary occasions we should be awkward insipid and ungraceful if the objects themselves did not appear to animate us with a considerable degree of passion to be anxious or to be laying a plot either to gain or to save a shilling would degrade the most vulgar tradesman in the opinion of all his neighbors let his circumstances be ever so mean no attention to any such small matters for the sake of the things themselves must appear in his conduct his situation may require the most severe economy and the most exact assiduity but each particular exertion of that economy and assiduity must proceed not so much from a regard for that particular saving or gain as for the general rule which to him prescribes with the utmost rigor such a tenor of conduct his parsimony to-day must not arise from the desire of the particular three pence which he will save by it nor his attendance to his shop from a passion for the particular ten pence which he will acquire by it but the one and the other ought to proceed solely from a regard to the general rule which prescribes with the most unrelenting severity this plan of conduct to all persons in his way of life in this consists the difference between the character of a miser and that of a person of exact economy and assiduity the one is anxious about small matters for their own sake the other attends to them only in consequence of the scheme of life which he has laid down to himself it is quite otherwise with regard to the most extraordinary and important objects of self-interest a person appears mean-spirited who does not pursue with some degree of earnestness for their own sake we should despise a prince who is not anxious about conquering or defending a province we should have little respect for a private gentleman who did not exert himself to gain an estate or even a considerable office when he could acquire them without either meanness or injustice a member of parliament who shews no keenness about his own election is abandoned by his friends as altogether unworthy of their attachment even a tradesman is thought a poor spirited fellow among his neighbors who does not bestir himself to get what they call an extraordinary job or some uncommon advantage this spirit and keenness constitutes the difference between the man of enterprise and the man of dull regularity those great objects of self-interest of which the loss or acquisition quite changes the rank of the person are the objects of the passion properly called ambition a passion which when it keeps within the bounds of prudence and justice is always admired in the world and has even sometimes a certain irregular greatness which dazzles the imagination when it passes the limits both of these virtues and is not only unjust but extravagant hence the general admiration for heroes and conquerors and even for statesmen whose projects have been very daring and extensive though altogether devoid of justice such as those of the cardinals of richelieu and retz the objects of avarice and ambition differ only in their greatness 
a miser is as furious about a halfpenny as a man of ambition about the conquest of a kingdom. 2. Secondly, I say, it will depend partly upon the precision and exactness, or the looseness and inaccuracy of the general rules themselves, how far our conduct ought to proceed entirely from a regard to them. The general rule of almost all the virtues, the general rules which determine what are the offices of prudence, of charity, of generosity, of gratitude, of friendship, are in many respects loose and inaccurate admit of many exceptions, and require so many modifications that it is scarce possible to regulate our conduct entirely by a regard to them. The common proverbial maxims of prudence, being founded in universal experience, are perhaps the best general rules which can be given about it. To effect, however, a very strict and literal adherence to them would evidently be the most absurd and ridiculous pedantry. Of all the virtues I have just now mentioned, gratitude is that, perhaps, of which the rules are the most precise, and admit of the fewest exceptions. That as soon as we can, we should make a return of equal, and if possible of superior value, to the services we have received, would seem to be a pretty plain rule, and one which admitted of scarce any exceptions. Upon the most superficial examination, however, this rule will appear to be in the highest degree loose and inaccurate, and to admit of ten thousand exceptions. If your benefactor attended you in your sickness, ought you to attend him in his? Or can you fulfill the obligation of gratitude by making a return of a different kind? If you ought to attend to him, how long ought you to attend him? The same time which he attended you, or longer, and how much longer? If your friend lent you money in your distress, ought you to lend him money in his? How much ought you lend him? When ought you to lend him? Now, or to-morrow, or next month? And for how long a time? It is evident that no general rule can be laid down by which a precise answer can, in all cases, be given to any of these questions. The difference between his character and yours, between his circumstances and yours, may be such that you may be perfectly grateful and justly refuse to lend him a halfpenny, and on the contrary you may be willing to lend or give to him ten times the sum which he lent you, and yet justly be accused of the blackest ingratitude, and of not having fulfilled the hundredth part of the obligation you lie under. As the duties of gratitude, however, are perhaps the most sacred of all those which the beneficent virtues prescribe to us, so the general rules which determine them are, as I said before, the most accurate. Those which ascertain the actions required by friendship, humanity, hospitality, generosity, are still more vague and indeterminate. There is, however, one virtue which the general rules determine with the greatest exactness every external action which it requires. This virtue is justice. The rules of justice are accurate in the highest degree, and admit of no exceptions or modifications, but such as may, may be ascertained as accurately as the rules themselves, and which generally, indeed, flow from the very same principles with them. If I owe a man ten pounds, justice requires that I should precisely pay him ten pounds, either at the time agreed upon or when he demands it. What I ought to perform, how much I ought to perform, when and where I ought to perform it, the whole nature and circumstances of the action prescribed, all of them precisely fixed and determined. Though it may be awkward and pedantic, therefore, to effect too strict an adherence to the common rules of prudence or generosity, there is no pedantry in sticking fast by the rules of justice. On the contrary, the most sacred regard is due to them, and the actions which this virtue requires are never so properly performed as when the chief motive for performing them is a reverential and religious regard to those general rules which require them. In the practice of the other virtues, our conduct should rather be directed by a certain idea of propriety, by a certain taste for a particular tenor of conduct, than by any regard to a precise maxim or rule. And we should consider the end and foundation of the rule more than the rule itself. But it is otherwise with regard to justice, 
the man who in that refines the least, and adheres with the most obstinate steadfastness to the general rules themselves, is the most commendable, and the most to be depended upon. Though the end of the rules of justice be to hinder us from hurting our neighbor, it may frequently be a crime to violate them, though we could pretend, with some pretext of reason, that this particular violation could do no hurt. A man often becomes a villain the moment he begins, even in his own heart, to chicane in this manner, the moment he thinks of departing from the most staunch and positive adherence to what those inviolable precepts prescribe to him. He is no longer to be trusted, and no man can say what degree of guilt he may not arrive at. The thief imagines he does no evil when he steals from the rich. What he supposes they may easily want, and what possibly they may never even know has been stolen from them. The adulterer imagines he does no evil when he corrupts the wife of his friend, provided he covers his intrigue from the suspicion of the husband, and does not disturb the peace of the family. When once we begin to give way to such refinements, there is no enormity so gross of which we may not be capable. The rules of justice may be compared to the rules of grammar, the rules of the other virtues, to the rules which critics lay down for the attainment of what is sublime and elegant in composition. The one are precise, accurate, and indispensable. The others are loose, vague, and indeterminate, and present us rather with the general idea of the perfection we ought to aim at than afford us any certain and infallible directions for acquiring it. A man may learn to write grammatically by rule, with the most absolute infallibility, and so perhaps he may be taught to act justly. But there are no rules whose observance will infallibly lead us to the attainment of elegance or sublimity in writing, though there are some which may help us, in some measure, to correct and ascertain the vague ideas which we might otherwise have entertained of those perfections and there are no rules by the knowledge of which we can infallibly be taught to act upon all occasions with prudence, with just magnanimity, or proper beneficence, though there are some which may enable us to correct and ascertain, in several respects, the imperfect ideas which we might otherwise have entertained of those virtues. It may sometimes happen that with the most serious and earnest desire of acting, so as to deserve approbation, we may mistake the proper rules of conduct, and thus be misled by that very principle which ought to direct us. It is vain to expect that in this case mankind should entirely approve of our behavior. They cannot enter into that absurd idea of duty which influenced us, nor go along with any of the actions which follow from it. There is still, however, something respectable in the character and behavior of one who is thus betrayed into vice by a wrong sense of duty, or by what is called an erroneous conscience. How fatally soever he may be misled by it, he is still, with the generous and humane, more the object of commiseration than of hatred or resentment. They lament the weakness of human nature which exposes us to such unhappy delusions, even while we are most sincerely laboring after perfection and endeavoring to act according to the best principle which can possibly direct us. False notions of religion are almost the only causes which can occasion any very gross perversion of our natural sentiments in this way, and that principle which gives them greatest authority to the rules of duty is alone capable of distorting our ideas of them in any considerable degree. In all other cases, common sense is sufficient to direct us, if not to the most exquisite propriety of conduct, yet to something which is not very far from it. And provided we are in earnest desirous to do well, our behavior will always, upon the whole, be praiseworthy. That to obey the will of the deity is the first rule of duty, all men are agreed. But concerning the particular commandments which that will may impose upon us, they differ wildly from one another. In this, therefore, the greatest mutual forbearance and toleration is due, and though the deference of society requires that crime should be punished from whatever motives they proceed, yet a good man will always punish them with reluctance when they evidently proceed from false notions of religious duty.' 
he will never feel against those who commit them that indignation which he feels against other criminals, but will rather regret and sometimes even admire their unfortunate firmness and magnanimity at the very time that he punishes their crime. In the tragedy of Mahomet, one of the finest of Mr. Voltaire's, it is well represented what ought to be our sentiments for crimes which proceed from such motives. In that tragedy, two young people of different sexes, of the most innocent and virtuous dispositions, and without any other weakness except what endears them the more to us, a mutual fondness for one another, are instigated by the strongest motives of a false religion to commit a horrid murder that shocks all the principles of human nature. A venerable old man, who had expressed the most tender affection for them both, for whom, notwithstanding, he was the avowed enemy of their religion, they had both conceived the highest reverence and esteem, and who was in reality their father, though they did not know him to be such, is pointed out to them as a sacrifice which God had expressly required at their hands, and they are commanded to kill him. While they are about executing this crime, they are tortured with all the agonies which can arise from the struggle between the idea of the indispensableness of religious duty on one side, and compassion, gratitude, reverence for the age, and love for the humanity and virtue of the person whom they are going to destroy on the other. The representation of this exhibits one of the most interesting and perhaps the most instructive spectacle that was ever introduced upon any theatre. The sense of duty, however, at last prevails over all the amiable weaknesses of human nature. They execute the crime imposed upon them, but immediately discover their error, and the fraud which had deceived them, and are distracted with horror, remorse, and resentment. Such as are our sentiments for the unhappy Sayyid and Palmyra, such ought we to feel for every person who is in this manner misled by religion when we are sure that it is really religion which misleads him, and not the pretense of it, which is made a cover to some of the worst human passions. As a person may act wrong following a wrong sense of duty, so nature may sometimes prevail and lead him to act right in opposition to it. We cannot in this case be displeased to see that motive prevail which we think ought to prevail, though the person himself is so weak as to think otherwise. As his conduct, however, is the effect of weakness, not principle, we are far from bestowing upon it anything that approaches to complete approbation. A bigoted Roman Catholic, who, during the massacre of St. Bartholomew, has been so overcome by compassion as to save some unhappy Protestants, whom he thought it his duty to destroy, would not seem to be entitled to that high applause which we should have bestowed upon him, had he exerted the same generosity with complete self-approbation. We might be pleased with the humanity of his temper, but we should still regard him with a sort of pity which is altogether inconsistent with the admiration that is due to perfect virtue. It is the same case with all the other passions. We do not dislike to see them exert themselves properly, even when a false notion of duty would direct the person to restrain them. A very devout Quaker, who upon being struck upon one cheek instead of turning up the other, should go so far to forget his literal interpretation of our Saviour's precept, as to bestow some good discipline upon the brute that insulted him, would not be disagreeable to us. We should laugh and be diverted with his spirit, and rather like him the better for it. But we should by no means regard him with that respect and esteem which would seem due to one who, upon a like occasion, had acted properly from a just sense of what was proper to be done. No action can properly be called virtuous which is not accompanied with the sentiment of self-approbation. End of section 20